let me just run you through some numbers here. Like I ask the real estate agents every month a whole range of questions in conjunction with REI and Z. And uh, earlier this year, sort of January, February was the worst. I had a net 72% of the agents saying, oh, we are seeing fewer people at auctions. Now that's only a net 52%. It's negative, it's bad, but it's not as bad. Welcome back to Tea with Tony. We are past the midpoint of 2022, and it seems that every month when I sit down to write this intro, things have got progressively tougher for everyday Kiwis. And while this isn't a surprise based on what we cover in this segment, the highest inflation in 30 years, continued rising interest rates, and a general overall negative outlook for the economy are bearing heavy on a population that's also getting hammered by COVID and the flu just when we'd all hoped we'd made it safely out the other side. We need some sunshine. And surprisingly, there's one economist who might just have some to share around. Hello, Tony, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks, Lenska. But yeah, just a warning to people, uh, don't get uh, too optimistic thinking I'm going to say, everything's fine, uh, next week it's going to be sort of blooming roses, etc. Um, things are still tough out there, it's just that I can see signs mm. of a time down the track when things are better. So you yeah, curb your optimism in the short term. <laughs> uh, well, that's interesting because this week I, I felt the same way and that's why I've written this the way I did is when I listened to one of your segments, I found that some of your medium to, to long term outlooks were surprisingly or, you know, logically, but surprisingly optimistic. And I thought that was quite a nice place to start. I'm certainly not suggesting that um, things are amazing for everyone because I think that's the point everyone's feeling very heavy and um, as I said in the introduction it's not a surprise to us but it is quite um, difficult for a lot of people at the moment so um, talk talk us through that Tony talk us through why you're reasonably optimistic about the medium and the longer term um, and we can we can we will definitely delve into some of the current factors um, but I get that sense based on what we talked about last time we're in the short-term pain for long-term gain is probably a nice way to put it but over to you yes yes certainly the short-term pain and a key point to note here um, is that we've got interest rates going up they've gone up three to three and a half percent uh, for the uh, two to five year fixed uh, mortgage rates and so you know people have been hit by that um, but that only affects maybe one third of households in New Zealand so monetary policy tightens one third of households are affected remember one third are renting they, they, they don't own the house and of the ones that are own their house half of them have already paid off their mortgage so when interest rates go up you're only actually hitting one third of the population but the unique characteristic of the moment that we have not seen before in three decades is that the cost of living is soaring 7.3 percent increase in the past year and that hits everybody every household out there and this has been my key point since february when i could see in my monthly spending plan survey people slashing their plans to buy on things and now they've cut them even further um, over the past uh, few weeks and and that says to me the reserve bank is actually getting a lot of the restraint it wants in the economy not from necessarily the interest rates going up but of course from the the cost of living rising for everybody and at the same time as we're, we're putting money aside to have to buy our groceries involuntarily we are uniquely voluntarily putting money aside to spend on traveling overseas as well this is exceedingly weird um, in this time of restraint we're determined to travel overseas and we look at Europe and all the seas of baggage over there and the queues these people are determined to travel so that's really good for us when our summer comes along and they're looking to escape their winter I think we can look forward to some good uh, international visitor numbers coming um, down here and, uh, mm. and, and it drags money away from other things that we would be spending on and the warning I remember giving from about 18 months ago was that if your business businesses booming at the moment and you didn't expect it back in late 220 through 2021 maybe it's because uh, you're selling something we Kiwis are binging on when we can't travel overseas and I'd always cite spas or gazebos or kayaks these sort of things well there was always going to be a day of reckoning when we don't need another spa and we don't need any more kayaks and we've already got trade me uh, with greater numbers of home exercise uh, machines uh, uh, being got rid of um, there's a big decline going on in our spending on some of these things as well so the negatives definitely dominate but 
key point I've been making has been, you know, when we normally have a big downturn in New Zealand, often it's because the interest rates have gone up strongly and the Kiwi dollar has gone through mm. the roof. And so the farmers get absolutely munted, zero of that. We're at 62 US cents. A year ago, we were 69 cents. We're below 90 against the Aussie dollar. The Kiwi dollar is below average, and that is stimulatory for our export sector, for the region, so not just you know, more visitors, tourists and Queen Street, etc. cetera, um, but for regions, this is quite a good thing. And, and Internationally, of course, we've had uh, high oil and food prices, a food price crisis. We are a food exporter. High food prices is good for us. And on average, our export prices are 25% higher than uh, almost three years ago at the end of 2019. And on top of all that is sort of factors that say to me, you know, it's not the end of the world is the labour market. The unemployment rate currently 3.2%, although by the time many people get to look at this, uh, uh, we'll have new data, and the unemployment rate might be as low as 2.8%. There's high job security out there, and that counts for a lot for the housing market, which we can chat about later. Yeah, look, thanks for that, Tony. So I'm, I'm going to break some of that down, um, and we are going to talk about some of the, the challenges that we do every every month, but I think that was a really nice overview of, of some optimistic factors. Um, let's talk about inflation. 7.3%, a little higher than they thought, highest in 30 years. It's all a bit ugly, um, and remarkably not as high as what's happening in the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, but has it peaked? I think it probably has peaked because for a number of reasons. Um, number one, the international oil prices, of course, have uh, pulled back um, a bit. Uh, petrol prices have fallen away, what, 30 cents or so here in New Zealand. So that's going to put a lot of downward pressure on whatever the number turns out to be for the September quarter. We'll get that in the middle of October. And also in the rental market, this is very interesting. There's a monthly survey I do with a property management agency and, and the investors are pulling back on how much they plan or would like to increase rents by and even the, the proportion of them planning to increase their rents has gone from about 79% down to 70% and there was a uh, commentary I think it was on the basis of Trade Me data showing rents falling in some parts of the country at the moment and there's, there's developing a little bit of an oversupply of rental property. Some people who were looking to sell their property so no tenants in it uh, are not looking at getting the price that they want so they're putting it back in the rental pool. We've got some young people because of the high cost of uh, living increase have gone back to living with their parents. Some who were thinking about leaving home, the, the reality came in pretty quickly once they ran the numbers and have decided not to leave home for the moment. And of course we've got a number of young people going overseas as well to either just do an OE uh, or to simply you know work and earn a much higher wage in Australia. So you know rents starting to pull back adds to some disinflationary pressure. So yeah, I think the chances are good that we have seen the peak for New Zealand's inflation rate slash change in the annual cost of living at 7.3%. Well, that's really good news. And um, as I always say, you can't you know, guarantee that, but you, you do base your uh, on evidence, e evidence, which is great. Um, my understanding is, though, it's not all roses because it will have a long tail, so it's not going to drop from seven to three, is it? Which is where we really need to be. It's going to, how long, Tony, before we get down to three, kind of, within that Reserve Bank remit? I'd say towards the end of 2023, if we look at the United States, where, as you note, you know, things are uh, more expensive. For many countries overseas, there's the high dependency upon gas prices, which have gone through the roof, so it's sort of an extra uh, uh, thing in, in there. Um, in the United States, the common expectation is that their inflation rate will be just below 3% at the end of 2023. Now, I, I think we could be quite close to that, uh, frankly, um, as well. When we look at the fact that you know, economic activity in New Zealand is, is going to be reasonably suppressed for a while with near record low levels of business confidence and consumer co confidence. So, you know, it, it won't be an immediate uh, uh, falling away. But for me, as an economist, my interest is the changes at the margin. What's been the most recent change and how does that influence people's thinking? And my view is that when we get the middle of October next inflation number, more people are going to be thinking, okay, inflation is falling away. What does that mean for interest rates? Oh, I think it means interest rates falling away. And in fact, by the middle of October, I think we'll have had some cuts in fixed interest rates out there. And that starts to set the scene for something different to happen in the housing market, probably before the end um, of, this, uh, of, of this year. We talk about 
um, inflation and you know seven point three percent and and three percent. But at let's bring this back to everyday human Kiwi terms. So a three percent. Am I right in saying one to three percent is pretty normal? People aren't going to be noticing massive price increases in their supermarket trolleys. But when you get to seven percent everyone can feel it so that's kind of that's why that remit is set at one to three and can you notice it at three percent or is it kind of a bit less noticeable oh, well, well first of all the remit is set at uh keeping inflation between one to three three percent not because of the immediate impact on uh, people's uh, uh, household incomes but because of the negative impact on an economy's growth rate productivity growth income growth if inflation averages above three percent and we start to spend a lot more time figuring out What's the market price? What can I increase in price in my selling, you know, what I'm selling, rather than developing new products and looking for efficiencies? You get efficiency losses in the economy and people thinking, well, I don't think I'll set up a business. Maybe I'll simply make more money if I buy things that rise in price when inflation is, you know, is high. So you know, that, that, that's what, it's, what it is about with that, that, that inflation. But you're right, when inflation is chugging along at 3%, in fact, when inflation is any rate, that doesn't mean everything's changing at that rate. Uh, there's about 650 items in the basket of consumer goods and services, and you might have 400 rising in price and 250 falling in price. And of course, electronic goods, etc., have plummeted in price over a great number of years. In the coming year, we're probably going to have used car prices starting to fall away after rising strongly. You know, they'll be starting to fall, fall uh, away. So, you know, it varies. Sparkles. What, what, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it varies from one family to another um, um, out there. But yeah, definitely we, we notice 7%, but th there's more than that. Um, I remember uh, one of my favourite books uh, read, bought and read years ago, The Sugar Bag Years by Tony Simpson, uh, about the experiences of common families just during the Great Depression of the 1930s. And uh, I remember reading an interesting section in there about a lot of well-off families who the Depression didn't necessarily affect them all that much, but they didn't want to be driving around in a flash car while other people were clearly suffering out there. So they tended to put their car up on the blocks and sort of go out and sympathy join in with everybody else and I think that's one of the phenomena at the moment that there'll be a lot of families in New Zealand who can easily afford 7.3% increase in their expenses. I, I Look I couldn't agree more I think that's really interesting that it, there's an aspect I think about around responsibility respect and um, you know people don't like it when society doesn't function as they think it should and that they know people New Zealand's too small we don't you know we're not that classist we see we all know people that are struggling to put petrol in their cars or you know really noticing the difference at the supermarket and you know I, I think that that sentiment is even if you can afford it it, it makes you feel uncomfortable and that's a, that's my kind of human analysis of it and that's why I was really looking forward to talking to you today to kind of give us all a bit more of a kind of a big picture view which is what we do. Thanks for that Tony. Look let's talk about interest rates. You've mentioned them a couple of times. Um, it's a topic close to NZHL's heart um, although we tend not to focus on the rate. We focus on other wonderful things which help you get there faster. Um, but talk to us about interest rates. Have you know, have they also peaked? You mentioned that, and um, I, it seems the OCR's got a little bit further to go, but give us your take. Yes, okay, so where do we start on, on, on this one? The uh, If you look at the United States, the data coming out recently have been much worse than expected for the rate of growth in their economy. The same in Germany, the same in England, uh, and it's led to a developing view that maybe the world economy is heading into a recession, not a deep one, not a GFC, but in a recession, well, inflationary pressures can fall away way relatively quickly. Not a big long tail of inflation, but you can actually have inflation falling relatively quickly. And that's meant that the markets have started to price in something very, very special. They are pricing in that the central banks like our Reserve Bank, Australia, US, etc., will keep in increasing interest rates very quickly in the short term, but they're going to be cutting them again before the end of 2023. The markets are pricing in two cuts at least in the United States funds rates before the end of 2023. And here in New Zealand, the markets are thinking about our central bank, the Reserve Bank, will be cutting interest rates before the end of 2023 um, as well. And in anticipation of that sort of, you know, we've had the likes of the cost to a bank in New Zealand of borrowing money at a fixed rate 
to lend out at a fixed rate for two years in this case. Uh, that peaked at about 4.5% in the middle of June or so, it's uh, now sitting at 3.9%. And so, in fact, we've already had some cuts in the two-year fixed mortgage rates out there. But we've also got reductions in that cost of bank borrowing for three, four, five, you know, seven-year fixed interest rates as well. So where we stand right at the moment, actually, margins for banks are above average for fixed rates three, four, five years. There's scope for them to cut them, um, quite frankly. And my view is we are either at, we're, we're pretty much at the peaks for three year plus fixed mortgage rates. Two years, we probably have seen the peak. One year could le be a little bit further to go. And that's because of this other interesting characteristic of interest rates at the moment. I've said the Reserve Bank takes them up quickly and then maybe they're cutting before the end of the year. And so somebody looking at this will go, well, what, why would they increase them so quickly now if they're only going to cut them again 12 to 15 months down the track? Why central banks are raising interest rates so quickly now is a matter of regaining credibility. Uh, the credibility of central banks around the world as staunch fighters against inflation has been severely damaged by the fact they left interest rates too low for too long last year and they printed too much money for too long. And they should have been taking the sugar, the candy away um, at least over the second half of 2021. And they didn't. And so every man and his dog is sticking the boot into the central banks around the planet at the moment. Um, it's not a good space to be in and the central bankers need to regain credibility and I would suggest they are strongly regaining their credibility with their inflation fighting credentials with the speed of interest rate increases um, at the moment but we're getting we're going to be near the end of that within frankly maybe three months or so and I remain of the view that the peak for the official cash rate in New Zealand two and a half percent at the moment will be three and a half um, um, percent not the four percent the Reserve Bank mentioned and then as I say I see things edging off again over 2023. Once the central banks see credibility is established, economic outlook is a bit weak, inflation is going to fall away a bit quicker than, than we've been thinking. These are sort of some things still in train out there. So I know for some people it has been surprising for me over the past maybe three months to be talking about interest rates coming down, but that's the nature of mm. cycles. Things go up in economics, they go down, they go up, and then they come back down again a little bit. But you've been talking about this for months and, and this is not new information and, and I think at the beginning of the year we were talking about um, the banks just not being, the central banks just not being quick enough to to respond. That's the main issue and I think as you say there's an acknowledgement of that now in their current behaviour. Um, so just on interest rates, we've got an OCR announcement coming up in August and you, you're advised, I think I read something Every, every economist and dog is talking about that there'll be another 50 basis points rise. What that means for everyday Kiwis is, is, a, is probably a bump in those one-year rates. Is that correct, Tony? When the official cash rate goes up, you tend to get floating mortgage rates sort of increasing broadly in line with it. They're closely aligned. And the one-year fixed mortgage rate, it can face a bit of upward pressure as well. But beyond that, if you're looking as a customer there, say, at fixing your interest rate for two, two years, well, over the next two years, of course, interest rates will have gone up and be start to come down again. So the average sort of two year you know, rate there is gonna be different from where we're sitting at, um, um, at, at the moment. And so yeah, when they increase again, it probably won't have much impact at all on the fixed mortgage rates out there, uh, quite frankly. Interestingly, if they raise again 50 points and go, oh, we're still very seriously worried about inflation out there, we are really gonna be quite staunch out there, you could get falls in the fixed interest rates because the markets, you know, people like myself will go, well, actually, now I think they're definitely overshooting on the top side. They're going to tighten monetary policy too much. They're going to really crunch the economy. <laughs> Inflation's going to be 2% come the end of 2023, and the interest rates will fall away. And that is exactly a version of that which has run through the United States financial markets over the past uh, uh, few weeks, just you know, for people's guide. What, what does it all add up to, I suppose, from a borrower's point of view? It means uh, you know, for most people are incentivized to have a look at maybe fixing one year, maybe a little bit two years. There's good security there. At some point down mm. the track, the optimal thing to do will be to uh, take just the floating rate. I, I personally wouldn't. I would, I'm not there at the moment. If I had a mortgage I was looking to do something with currently, I'd be looking at the fixing the one year, maybe a little bit at two years, something something like that. So not advice to anyone. You definitely need to talk to your 
advisor out there. Just remember, you know, yeah, the interest rate forecast many of us have been making for the past few years, not too good, especially over the past two and a half years initially. No, no. And look, Tony and I always mention this here, but it's really important. Tony's not a financial advisor and nor, ni neither am I. And um, your financial, what you should do is based on your own personal situation and goals and go, go and talk to someone, talk to someone like NZHL or um, another broker or advisor that can give you the right sort of advice to get ahead in your situation. And we, we talk about this every month, but I cannot stress how important it is, um, especially at the moment when hearing Tony and I talk, you can see that it's it's a little bit like this. And um, and so you need to pick your way through and figure out what's right for you is, is the reality. But um, interesting stuff, Tony, and um, and quite optimistic. I did see, I thought Sharon Zona from the ANZ said thought that they may peak at 4%. She's the only economist that I've seen that said that, but we'll see if that changes over the next, the OCR, sorry, may peak at 4%. We'll see what happens there. Um, okay, now you made one other comment that I'm gonna just quickly mention and it was anecdotal and you and I I think are on the same page on this is the labour market improving is the labour market improving the labour market dynamics for this period of time are vastly different from any previous downturn so normally our economy is chugging along there's a you know cyclical upturn and businesses are going oh the economy's strong look at all the people that want to buy our stuff we're going to sell them more stuff so as a business you'll hire more people You'll, you'll buy or, or lease more premises, you'll get more raw materials coming in, the supply chain will be functioning well, so you order more widgets to make your products, etc. And then something happens in the economy to make growth slow down. Maybe it's an international oil shock, maybe inflation has come along, maybe the government needs to get deficit under control, but things start slowing down and the business person will go, oh, things are slowing down. We thought the customer numbers might grow 25% next year. Oh, they could fall 5%. What are we going to do with all these spare people? What are we going to do with all these spare inventories in the warehouses? And so then you get two things happening. Um, number one, uh, companies will look to get their inventories down as quickly as possible. So say they order their widgets from a manufacturer in Ekatahuna in New Zealand, they will say, sorry, we don't want any of your widgets for the next six months. The manufacturer closes down, it aggravates the downturn in the economy. That's called the inventory cycle. That's not going to happen much this time around because most businesses haven't been able to build up their inventories at all because of the supply chain difficulties. But the more important and one and relevant here is that there are not many people that growing, growing, hire lots of people and oh, there's a shock weakness in the economy. They haven't been able to grow their number of people. With a 3.2% unemployment rate, uh, businesses have been showing near record difficulties of finding skilled and unskilled labour. There are not many businesses in New Zealand outside or residential real estate and crypto trading or something like that who have their staff numbers um, at the moment. They're still trying to hire people. That means this period of weakness in the economy is one of the weirdest we've ever seen because you're not going to get that feeding unemployment on itself. You get laid off, I cut my spending. That The shop I go to, they lay people off as well, which things spiral down. So that's been relatively limited this time. And we've got to remember, let's say I say to you, there's going to be a recession. The economy will shrink by 1%. Oh, so 99% of economic activity that was happening before will continue to happen. The bulk of companies are still going to be fine. There's no shortage of businesses out there at the moment, and even the government and local authorities, hoping for a few others to fall over so they can hire their staff because they can't even produce the output they want to or meet the orders they've got at the moment you know, without the, you know, they haven't got the staff. So that's a unique dynamic. It's not saying to me the labour market's improving as such. The unemployment rate will go up, but it's not going to be something that's going to make people go, I'm deeply worried about my, my job, something like that. It's more going to be actually helping the economy function a little bit better. At the moment, we can't function too well in New Zealand because of a shortage of staff so it's going to be a positive thing largely 
Okay, Tony, what's happening in housing? Are we still we're still on this downward trajectory? Talk us through it. Yeah, okay. The housing market decidedly is weak at the moment. We have the number of sales running about 35, 40% lower than a year earlier. We have the average number of days being taken to sell a dwelling is about 13 days longer than a year ago. We have the number of properties uh, on realestate.co.nz listing for sale, the stock of listings up nationwide about 86% um, from a year earlier. And and of course, we have average prices around the country uh, down about 9.5% from their peak in November. Auckland is down about 13%. Wellington City is down about 17% um, or so. So, you know, uh, definitely the housing market is weak at the moment. That's the first thing to say. Secondly, the housing market is getting weaker. I do my uh, coalface surveys of mortgage advisors, of real estate agents, uh, etc., and they still overwhelmingly say there are fewer first home buyers uh, showing up to try and buy houses, fewer investors looking to do buying, fewer people showing up at, at uh, open homes and in auctions. So that's the second thing. It is still getting weaker, but that's not the space that I live in. I live as an economist at the very margin trying to see but, but what's changing at the edge. And what I can see happening is that the pace with which things are getting weaker is getting weaker. It's getting better. So it, and it's not improving. But let me just run you through some numbers here. Like I ask the real estate agents every month a whole range of questions in conjunction with REINZ. And uh, earlier this year, sort of January, February was the worst. I had a net 72% of the agents saying, oh, we are seeing fewer people at auctions. Now that's only a net 52%. It's negative. It's bad but it's not as bad. The number of people showing up at open homes, that's gone from minus 79% net seeing more people for the agents, now a net 47% of agents seeing fewer people at open homes. Bad, Ooh, but not as bad as before. The first home buyers is interesting. So back in about February, a net 71% of agents were seeing fewer home first home buyers. Now it's a net 36%. So it's still bad, but that, that's quite a change. At the margin, things are turning around and there's also fewer investors are selling. A lot of people are just stepping back, taking their property mm. off the market. And a key dynamic for the housing market this cycle is a near complete absence of distressed sellers. You see, that's what the tight labour market delivers to us. Not many people are fearful of losing their job. Or if they do, they know how they can get another job, you know, relatively um, um, quickly. So the banks are going to be putting very few people under. The investors, much as they don't like the tax changes, they're not selling in any great numbers. They just pull back as buyers. And so what I see in the market is a situation where people's thinking on interest rates is going to change over the next few months. Maybe the mid-October inflation number is a trigger towards oh, interest rates have peaked and now they're coming down again. So they'll think, oh, that's that's interesting. And there's a backlog of buyers building up. Uh, there's a lot of people want to buy, but they're scared that if I buy now, prices will fall a bit further and I'll feel silly and I'll look silly to my mates as well. So they're just stepping back from the market. At some point, they're going to step forward again. And I guess my gut is telling me, Elements of that, I think, will start happening before the end of this year. So I do expect average prices to fall, uh, maybe another 5%, something like that. And when they do, let's say all up prices fall 15% from their peak in November of last year. It's just completely a correction of the extra 15 to 20% that prices rose last year beyond what I thought they would. It's not economy is staffed, everything's falling away, everybody's leaving the country. It's simply a restoration of reality. And the Reserve Bank have explicitly said that. They have said once house prices fall 15, 15%, from the peaks, they will no longer consider prices to be unsustainable. So I think, oh, I haven't used this terminology for a while. I think we're entering the end game for the decline in the housing market. Um, different bits, different times, different regions, etc. So th that's my view. We're not there yet, okay? But the seeds are starting to be planted for this. That's a really measured and, and kind of interesting view around housing for everyday New Zealanders to bear in mind. So remind me how much, so if we got to a 15% correction, remind me how much 
pass prices exclo exploded post COVID? Like how much were they up? Okay, so in calendar 2019, average house prices in New Zealand rose by 7% assisted by interest rates being cut to record lows between May and August of 2019. So that was that was 7% in 2019. In 2020, they rose by 18%, 1.8%. And I look back with what I was writing early 2021, and I was saying, I think maybe there's another 5% left in these prices. They're looking a bit silly. They rose 23% on average, 2-3% in 2021. So that's why I say there's sort of an extra 15, 18, whatever percentage uh, extra increase there in 2021 which for me was beyond the pale sort of stuff and so that's why my interpretation so is that 48% Oh, sorry, Tony. Is that 48% since 2019? Uh, okay, I haven't from a starting point of 2019. Mm -hmm. You're probably about right. I mean, this is a shockingly swift increase over a three-year period of time, 19, oh. 20, 20, 21. So, so the reason I'm asking, if it's, if, it's an, if it's 30 to 50%, whatever it is, but if you take the fifth, unless if you take the 15%, so we get to a 15% drop, and it's 48% increase, you're still doing all right, aren't well, you? Most people are doing okay. <laughs> if prices fall 20%, that takes them back to where they were on average in December of uh, 2020. That's all we're looking at. It's a correction. I mean, normally, to put this in perspective, New Zealand is at risk at the moment of a foot and mouth outbreak, just like Australia. That is the big, everything I've said would be completely 100% wiped out if we got foot and mouth in New Zealand. So let's have no doubt um, about that. But generally, the scenario banks run when the Reserve Bank says, oh, you need to run a stress test. How would you be left off if New Zealand suffered a big shock? And the banks will go, okay, we'll model a big shock, and the shock will be foot and mouth in New Zealand. When the size of the economy may shrink by about 15% um, or so, uh, the unemployment rate might go to 20%, house prices might fall you know, 40%. You know, that's your disaster scenario. And one would think, well, surely if the prices fell 20%, it's sort of like half a foot and mouth outbreak. No, this is just a correction from ridiculous FOMO-driven levels in house prices um, over 20, 2021. That's all. And look, what we always say here is for those that, of course, it's hard if you weren't already in the market and you didn't experience that whole amount of growth. If you've come in at a, at a later time, Tony, you usually just say, look, write it out. If you can write it out, you can normally write it out. Get the advice you need. Um, and, you know, we don't want to be overly optimistic for pe because people in that situation, it would be quite difficult. Um, but the reality is you've been lent the money, as I always say, because you can generally afford it. And um, and you play the long-term game because, as Tony's clearly indicated, he's if everything goes to plan, we should be back into a growth cycle at some point. So um, that's that's a positive. Oh, definitely. Growth comes back. And let me, let me mention another factor I've mentioned before as well. Many people signed up one-year fixed rates at 2.19, 2.49% just over a year ago. So they're going from an interest rate here and they're jumping up, let's say, to 5.7% or something like that up there. Now, that's a big increase. It's a lot of extra money they have to find. But when they took the mortgage out, the bank they had to prove to the bank they could service an interest rate up here at about 65 7 8% or so four years ago. There are going to be very few people who are going to end up paying a higher interest rate now and in the coming 6 to 12 months, an interest rate higher then they proved they could service when the bank gave them the mortgage in the first place, 12, 24, 36, 48 months ago. So that limits, like I say, that distressed selling in the market. And for those who did buy uh, near the peak, um, just console yourself with the fact that uh, none of us can pick a peak in an asset market, shares, cryptos, houses. None of us can pick a trough. We just sort of broadly try to look for indicators. And definitely with uh, property, as with shares, it's the long-term holding that really, really matters. Short-term trading, it's it's a bit of a fool's game. But the long-term, generally, you know, things uh, like that tend to rise in price over time. Touch wood. <laughs> I told you a bit of sunshine. There, you've delivered it. You were you were you were you were concerned, and you've definitely delivered some sunshine. Look, thanks, Tony. As always, it's a great pleasure and. Um, lots in today um to to kind of unpick and i hope we um hope
but we've made it really consumable for everybody. Um, as I always say, um, Tony is an independent economist and we like it that way. His views are his own and um, not those of NZHL or vice versa. So um, thanks a lot, Tony. Thanks. Ta-da. Thanks a lot, everybody. And uh, we'll see you again next month.